My name is Daniel Bernier. I'm a technical director at Bell Canada, focusing on cloud transformation and other crazy things like P4 and Smart Nix. But uh, today I'm going to talk to you about something which is really interesting to us. It's uh, about leveraging Cilium with SRV6 for telco networking. Um, first, I'm going to start with some problems with the telco networking, and I think our colleagues from Swisscom were talking about it before. But um, Telco networking, although we would like it to be, is not something that we can talk typical. So most telcos, their networks are built through mergers, acquisitions, and although we would like them all to get consolidated, sometimes it never ends up, so we keep legacy devices that are ranging from the, even the 70s. Most telco networks are plagued with legacy technologies which never seem to go away. We still sell the S1s, the S0s, the gear is still there, the tools that come with it still there. So even though you like to go completely cloud native, that doesn't change. And the systems that you need to manage them with need to cope with that. Uh, most telcos networks are also bound by regulations, Sarbanes-Oxley, old sailing agreements, which you, you do, they do impose limitations on how you would like to do networking and how you need to keep networks segmented, isolated, otherwise it doesn't work. So the big fat net single VLAN that covers everything doesn't work in those kind of cases. Uh, most operators have dif differentiated services, which they do offer, and they, that also implies some reality checks around how you would like to do networking. Sometimes your TV delivery system will not be the same, or will not be able to run on the same as your mobile core. Uh, the systems will have to change. Oh, and there's still that 5G thing that everybody keeps talking about that's requiring a bunch of new things in our network. And it's uh, also coming with something which we call network slicing, we need to think about. So conclusion is, although we would like them to be, telco networks are not typical and they're not like any enterprise networks. Cloud native transformation for telcos is not just about CNFs. If you look at this, our IT systems need to be going cloud native. A lot of our systems that manage the network need to go cloud native, not just the function, and it's also an impact on their networking. Uh, and by the way, hyperscale clouds use the same technologies as hyperscale as we do in operator to build their networks. They run MPLS, they run IP network v6, they run uh, those classical device technologies. And whether we like it or uh, like it or not, network segmentation and isolation will not go away. The question is how we do it. So. Today, I'm not talking about how cloud native is affecting the telco. I'm going to just talk mostly about multi-networking and multi-interfaces. So even with all the potential alternatives that exist within Kubernetes, the multi-interface is still not a pleasing experience if you have to deal with it. Uh, you have to either static route, sprawl, forwarding rules that go really crazy on your pods. You could use VRF CNIs, but most apps still don't understand how to use VRS properly Linux kernel. So you kind of, it's a fun thing, but it doesn't really work. If you have multiple interface to support, which is able to suppose to be providing you isolation, for some reason we're kind of recreating the four-legged server which had a leg into a physical net because now pods have legs in four networks for some reason. So, and not to mention that the security policies don't necessarily follow those four interfaces, four new pod interfaces. Uh, and we still dump the problem most of the times to the network guys, and then we complain that the network doesn't work because we pass a VLAN, we dump traffic, and expect them to fix the problems. Uh, there's lots of third-party R-downs available. That's a, one of the beauty about Kubernetes is it's so malleable that you can add extensions and new features to it, new modules to it. But that comes with other problems. So now you have to deal with support model challenge. So I have a, I have a, a Kubernetes platform with its CNI, then I, I want to add another mesh. I want to add a, a third party mesh, which is not the same. I want to add another CNI because it does some cool things. Then you end up with four licenses to support and lose your single point of contact for this. And you also have to deal with the compatibility matrix. You want to upgrade your version of OpenShift, but then that, that new shiny mesh that you integrated that it is still not able to do so, so you have to wait. So that's not still fixing. And for just for fun, although it does work, have you ever tried to have a VPP based and then native CNI running on either Antos, EKS, or OCP? I still haven't been able to get it. So, uh, and by the way, I did try NSM for my feature set, so it was a, I, I, I'm coming from scars and experience, but it was a cool project. 
So let's try to find another way, because in the end, this is what we want. The developers should be able to create their applications, their pods, connect them to the network, and not have to worry too much, expect this to be black magic, but how to make the networking, even if complex, simplified for them so that it doesn't become a challenge. So that comes to the, that was the part about the multi-interface problem. Now I'm going to talk about technologies that exist in the networking protocols. Do I, that's, you know, you're going to see the, the linkage together, why it became so interesting for us. So I'm going to talk also about SRV6. So for those who know me, they know I have a pet peeve with SRV6. I've, I've been through this for a long time in IETF and other initiatives. It's basically a new way of doing routing based on IPv6. So I was quite happy to hear my dear telecom friends talking about IPv6 so, uh, so vividly. Uh, it's basically doing path routing, like a source routing based on either a 128-bit address scheme, like a segment of 128-bit, or multiple small segments of 16-bit. So you basically carve out the, the, sort, the, pack, the, the path of your network through the source address. Uh, it's based on a few drafts and a few standards, one of them being the network programming framework, where you actually you encode instructions in your network based on your IPv6 address scheme, and you can actually create programs or small policies. SRV6 is also not prescriptive, so it doesn't really care how you do the control plane of SRV6. It does BGP because it came out of IETF, but you can create your own SDN controller, you can use gRPC, whatever you feel like. Uh, it provides a single encapsulation to provide both overlay and underlay. And in the end, it still leverages pure base IPv6 routing, so you can actually simplify a lot of your network by just doing raw IPv6 routing. It also is based on a logic of policies. So based on how you define the, uh, the end behavior, the way your IPv6 is going to be treated at their destination, you create various policies, which is called in the, in the ITF term segment routing policies, that help you define how your network is going to treat the, pack, the, the application. And the traffic is steered into those policies, either some physical or virtual interfaces, five tuples or even more flow-based uh, mapping, GTP header remapping, and this is how you actually create what they call segment routing network policies. Is based on those parameters, you create constructs. I can do a layer two pseudo wire over an IPv6 header by doing the end.dx2. I can do IPv, uh, layer three VPNs with the DT46, which is a decapsulation in a two IP table lookup. And I can also do something which is quite getting quite a lot of traction right now is remapping GTP into IPv6 headers so you can completely remove the GTP problem uh, to and simplify your encapsulation in the network and then reconstruct it later on. For those who were not there at Mobile World Congress, SoftBank did a, quite a good demo on this. Uh, so what we did is we look at how could we leverage SRV6 with Cilium because of the eBPF base it has in, the, in its data plane, and how could we construct a new way of doing networking for, uh, from the, uh, for our clusters? So we're working with the Isovalen team, we looked at various scenarios, and I'm going to do a small talk, and then afterwards I'm going to try and do a demo if the Wi-Fi agrees with me. Uh, so basically, based on the fact that it's pure IPv6, so a cluster that, does, that is completely V6 can, doesn't need to have any encapsulation. The only thing that really makes it work really quite well is if you're able to run in something what you call flat mode, or in the case of Google Cloud, they call it VPC native, but AWS have the same. So you don't constrain your IPv6 addresses into part of your pod, you, make them, you let them loose, as I would say. And based on this, V6 routing doesn't need to think about anything, not even segment routing V6. V4, on the other hand, you can actually encapsulate if you want to, or you can add, use the CNI mechanism of, of Cilium if you want, like cluster mesh. But for a paradigm, we actually did the look the way of, can I have a V4 pod talk to another V4 pod using an SRV6 encapsulation over Cilium? And that way, you make, you make your underlay network completely V6. We also look at the way to do cluster, a cluster talking to L3 VPN PE, a physical PE in the network and how to do this from Cilium. The, the beauty of this is I have a single interface. I have no multiple interface to talk to VPNs. I don't, I can I still associate my pods to multiple VRFs based on the egress policies. Because you remember in SRV6, I was talking about SR policies. In Cilium, we constructed the, the notion of SRV6, SRV6 egress policies. So based on criteria in the pod definition, you say I, I need to be attached to VRF 0 and 1 in the case of our demo. 
And based on this, with the learn the route, the, the Cilium learns from the BGP, the, this BGP neighbors, is able to construct dynamically the egress policies associated to the VRF so that single default route, single interface, you can still talk default internet or default behavior with the standard construct of Kubernetes, but in the case you need to go somewhere in the, in the deep of your network to VRFs, you can use the egress policy of Cilium, it makes it work. In our case, as I show there, the pod needs to go talk to an application over an L3VPN P in SRV6 domain, it just goes across. And then the beauty comes with the rest of the integration when you look at SRV6 overall. So Cilium still does its magic, integrate single route table, single interface, the egress policy is still there, but oh, by the way, that the, the destination P is not SRV6, it's a legacy classic MPLS. In that case, the SRV6 architecture allows for gateways to be able to translate from an SRV6 domain or IPv6 domain to any other model. In that case, we do MPLS. So going from an IPv6 flat net fabric, no SRV6 device unless, except for the gateway function, that translates into MPLS, and my cluster is still able to go and talk to VRS. And then I can do in service insertion. For those who were at MPLS Paris this year, I did a remote talk around the fact that we integrated like physical devices into an SRV6 domain using services proxy, kind of the logic of an Envoy proxy, but or like a proxy-less mesh for those who are able to do it, uh, but for physical device as well. And in that case, Cilium does the same magic, single interface, but now you can construct either dynamically uh, through BGP advertisement or statically through the policies created in Cilium. You can also insert physical or attach physical services within your network to that construct. So I can actually create a chain from my network physical devices or virtual network uh, elements still going to the application. And if you look at this, this is the simplicity of interconnecting the clouds in, our, in an environment. I need to map VRFs or VLANs from a cluster, make them go to our network, redo the mapping to any VRF I need to have in my network, but I still need VRF in my physical network. Now go to my interconnection, map that back to VLANs, and now I go to the clouds, and the clouds don't have multi, and, uh, so I need to create a, a, a large amount of VPCs and try to interconnect them. If you look at this, and if I can start having my, my clusters be able to do a basic IPv6 overlay end-to-end, -end, the only thing that's missing now is to be able to say, well, public cloud, can you just provide me IPv6? And in that case, I can actually do a single flat IPv6 address scheme with my cloud providers, and my VRS or my isolation I need to have it will be done directly by the, by the CNI. Before I go to the demo, if, do you think do you want to pass the questions for after, or you want to go to the, 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 the demo in case it actually works? So what could go wrong? I think right now it's only the wireless. Uh, what, da, da, da. Sorry. What? Simple demo topology, so I have Cilium with two pods that need to talk to two different VRS, but the same address scheme. And there's a physical PE which is running FR Linux because FR supports SRV6. And at the end I have the devices, so I'm going to show the, the pods, I'm going to show the routing table of the pod, the, the, the interface of the pod. I'm going to see the encapsulation happening in Cilium from when it case it goes to SRV6, and the case where you don't see any encapsulation because it's actually doing the default Routing of the pod. Doom, doom, doom. Wi-Fi is still up. Yes. Now it's going to be fun trying to do this remote. Okay. So Wi-Fi. Okay. This is fun. You make the text bigger. I actually try to trying to see it from the back. Okay. Oh my God! I think I'm gonna have to do a session with at uh, the table with the speed it's got. 
Okay, so I have my two VR, my two uh, cluster VR, uh, client VRFs, the client uh, pods that are attached to different, that need to talk to different VRFs. I'm going to try now and show you the routing tables. I'm going to switch to this. God, it's painful. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to get back my command, but uh, the speed of the Wi Fi is not helping me. Okay. So I'm going to first start to show you. Show you policy, so it's going to help. So you see, this is a dynamic policy that was created through the route advertisement that it receives. You have the VRF ID and the destination SID, which is a segment routing uh, ID that's going to use to add a remote PE. And you have the destination CIDRs that are used to map for the policy. I can just try to get you to the get to the pod. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Sorry. This is painful. Okay, let's try this one. Come on. Okay, I'm going to switch things. System preference. This is not helping me. Okay. No, I'm just switch mirrors, so it's going to be easier for me. No, oh, but no, it's a bit too late now. <laughs> okay, no, it's okay. I'm going to make it work. Okay. So, first, I'm going to show route. So you see that, I, for those who don't see, sorry, but I only have one single interface in my pod. I only have a one uh, uh, um, and one route. Now I'm going to do a ping of Google, the famous Google. So you see here, you only see the BGP advertisements coming up, but there's no traffic going through the PE at the end remote because the traffic is not encapsulated. It's not part of the egress policy. 
So it's basic net Kubernetes networking going on. There's nothing happening. Now I'm going to switch, and you're going to see now I'm going to ping the right location. And now you see the encapsulation happening. You see the, the source address 10.1.156 going to 10.3.0.1, being encapsulated into SRV6 from Cilium. So I can now use an L3 VPN. In that case, we did a L3 VPN going to a remote PE using IPv6 SRV6. But again, no multi-interface, no secondary CNI, pure, a single one, and it's just a matter of having the right BGP policies and the eVPF code to map that back into a dynamic egress policy. Um, with that, I'm going to go back to my famous presentation. If you want to have a session, the question about the way that things are constructed after, because I burned some, so many valuable minutes on my demo, uh, we, I, we can do the discussion afterwards. No, again, I'm... Hello. Okay, let's go here. I'm going to stay this way because for some reason. Uh, so the next step. So right now, FR only works with SRV6 in the mode of um, um, base IP uh, segment ID under 28 bits. Uh, the next step is working through the community with FR to support also the micro SID instruction 32 bit uh, by 16. The good thing with FR is it's part of the big Sonic community. So a lot of people are already working through that effort with the SRV6. So we're, we're not alone in our world. Second one is optimize the SID allocation. How do we do a good, clean addressing scheme of IPv6? This is pure like uh, trying to figure out the right model to do the addressing scheme based on the, the, uh, how we do IPv6, uh, IPv6 assignment in Kubernetes. Uh, finishing the work with the Isovalent team on the BGP integration to make it crisp and production grade, I would say. Uh, this is the part with the, the Cilium project, with the, with the team. Uh, the rest is really keep tracking the IPv6 development in Kubernetes to ensure we don't end up redoing v4, but really maximize how IPv6 is used. Uh, this is for those who remember, which is actually a good thing, when you look at how you, you could use IPv6 in Kubernetes. If you really want to go crazy and try to burn 10 million containers per second, it will still take you 58,000 year, uh, 58, years before you actually max out a slash 64, which is right now how we do slash 64 in, in uh, assignments and pods. So I think we can burn a few IP addresses in, uh, to build the uh, network properly rather than do NAT port forwarding and all those things. Uh, uh, I think this way we can actually do this. And I also added a link which is around the, something that came out of the internet, uh, uh, the innovation of the internet with, from Etsy, which is around the design of IPv6 data centers. So um, a big thank you to the Ezovalent team. They have been ninjas with me up until three morning, three o'clock this morning to uh, make the demo crisp and clean, although my, I mess it up with uh, dealing with screens. Uh, so uh, a good shout out to the Ezovalent team, Luciano, uh, Christopher, Paul, and Yutaro. Uh, we're really, really uh, helpful with this. So if you have no questions, or if you have any questions, please go to the mic so that uh, everybody can hear. Oh, I think the mic is not on, though. Oh, no. Okay, no. Um, so first of all, thank you for the great talk. Um, I think we did something similar within Deutsche Telekom, uh, not with segment routing, but a bit differently. Um, I have one question because um, we've seen that with vendors, um, they heavily embrace and, and want to use multus for secondary interfaces within pods and heavily push back on a, I have one interface with different routes approach. Have you seen something similar and how to approach that? Or I, how do you approach we, that? You're right, we still do see this. Uh, the question I would ask though is uh, why? Except for, uh, except for um, uh, high speed interface, actually we can do with mm. AFXDP. 
Um, right now, actually, with Cilium code, we actually did like 23 gigs out of a 25 mm -hmm. gig NIC. So SROV pro for me would kind of seem something weird to have to fend them. But anyways, uh, most of the time, it's really around um, there's cases with protocols not supported inside, a, 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 but if you look something like this with a pod directly with an overlay, whatever protocol you need to pass to the pod, as Kubernetes doesn't see anything at, at that point, the pod still needs to do it. If it was V4, I understand you need to go through services because of the, the, the limitations, but V6 right now I would not have. So I think it's more cultural than a really big technical reason. Yeah, I think so as well. Thank you. No other question. Oh, there's a question. Okay, last question. If you have any other questions afterwards, uh, I'm here all day. And uh... okay, so uh, my question is that like, like, how much does uh, like the platform infrastructures are supporting this technology? Because if we rely on this, then it should be everywhere, basically. Can you please repeat a bit louder? Uh, yes. What is the support of this in in uh, in platforms like in Google Cloud or in in, in AWS? So um, in AWS, funny enough, I did this in 2018 and it worked like a charm. So from Montreal to Toronto, going through Ohio East, SRV6 end to end, I had never had any problems. So uh, the question is more around the way how Cilium is, is supported. Actually, Cilium is the default CNI for both Google Cloud now and uh, Amazon EKS. So uh, I, will not, I would have trouble understanding why this would not work in that case. The only trouble I might say, though, is the MTU size. But it's going to be the same for everybody. If they have any uh, uh, Kubernetes instance that has now a large MTUs because they do telco workloads, but their interconnect doesn't support a large MTUs, you're kind of in, the, in, their own, uh, in your own world. So that would be the only case right now. Thank you. Thank you very much.